coupling spatial and color coding in V1. Let's quickly recall how this is done in the retina. We start with three cone images, red, green, and blue, and then we decorrelate them in color dimensions into a luminous image and two chromatic images. One is a red-green contrast chromatic image, and the other is a blue-yellow contrast chromatic image. Then we do spatial coding parallelly for these three images. And the encoding spatial residue fields look like this for the luminous image, which usually has a higher signal to noise. We have these residue fields that looks like center surround bandpass filter in order to enhance contrast in this image. And then in the other two chromatic images, they are usually having a lower signal to noise. So therefore, their spatial coding filter is lower pass and uh, in order to smooth out noise. And as a result, these are the contrast sensitivity curves. It's more band pass. This is in frequency space and more low pass for the chromatic images. And then we go back to this three-dimensional cone color dimensions to do multiplexing to mix these three channels together to get the outcome, which is O1, O2, and O3. And from these outcomes, you can see now it's both spatially and color-wise encoded in an efficient manner. And these are the two uh, examples of the resulting residue fields as tuned to both space and color. For example, this one is red center excitatory and green surround inhibitory, and this one is the other way around. In V1, we do it analogously. Essentially, just replace the retinal spatial coding by v one spatial coding, which is now multi-scale and orientation tuned in many cases. Now the whole frequency range is divided into separate bands under the same contrast sensitivity curve and also the contrast sensitivity curve for, for the chromatic channels, which we also have multi-band, multi-scale coding. Now we can focus on one band at a time. Could be a high frequency band, low frequency band, intermediate frequency band, or a band tuned to a specific orientation, or even an, an untuned orientation. Then within any single band, we can just find the filters for luminance and chromatic channels before we multiplex them in the cone, three-dimensional cone dimensions before the cone space before we arrive at the final uh, encoded outputs. Then we can find the corresponding reset the field filters in color and space. And we will find a diversity of filters, including orientation untuned double opponent cells sensitive to color or orientation tuned uh, filters that are not sensitive to color or filters tuned to orientation and color. Let's start with a simple case with only two cone types, red and green. Let's say they have similar signal power statistically. We decorrelate them in the cone dimensions into luminance image and chromatic image. Now apply the V1 multi-scale encoding. We know that for the luminance image, each is a Gabor filter within one of these frequency band under the envelope of this more or less band pass filter for the contrast sensitivity curve. For the chromatic channel, it's more like a lower pass contrast sensitivity curve. However, we'll look at one scale at a time, could be in the low frequency scale or higher frequency scales. Each of them, we are phenomenologically modeling it as a Gabor filter with these gains according to where is the main frequency for the Gabor, okay? 
by these gains. Now we can multiplex these two in the cone dimensions. We use the inverse of this transform as this one happened to be the same. Now we get these outputs as the summation or difference of these two signals. Now, if we plug these in from the chromatic and luminance channels, so write these into the original red and green images, this is the output. The output for the first or second output nodes follows these equations as a function of the red input and green input. Therefore, this is the recitative field filter for the red input and this for the green input. Now we see how these filters should depend on the luminance filter and chromatic filter. And let's look at some examples. First, let's look at the frequency band with the smallest frequencies near zero frequency. The gain for the chromatic channel is much higher than the gain for the luminance channel. Notice that this is on a log scale, so this gain is much higher than that one. Now apply these two gains to the two Gabor filters, and these are the two examples where in the luminance filter we used, um, for example, the phase is 90 degrees, while for the chromatic filter we used a phase, for example, zero degrees. And we notice that here has a smaller amplitude than that because the gain for the luminous channel is much smaller than the gain for the chromatic channel. Yeah. And uh, now, now let's apply this formula to get our red filter and green filter as the summation of the luminous and the chromatic filter for the red and the difference between these two filters for the green. Yeah, and so red filter is the sum and green filter is the difference. And since the chromatic filter has a much larger amplitude, so this is negligible, the luminous filter. So the red and green filters are roughly opponent with each other. And therefore, these two filters are for a double opponent cell. Uh, illustrated in this two-dimensional space, it has a red center excitatory and green center inhibitory, while in the surround we have red inhibitory while green excitatory. And this cell is sensitive to mostly the chromatic signal, but insensitive to luminous signal because it has a small gain for the luminous signal. This recitative field is large because the frequency is low. It's called double opponent because it has an opponency in space between the center and surround, and another opponency in color between red and green. This um, recitative field is not tuned to orientation because in two-dimensional space the smallest band is actually this one it's really uh, isotropic in horizontal, for horizontal versus vertical orientation so it's not tuned to uh, orientation when the frequency is slightly higher let's say this band okay um, it's not quite zero frequency but slightly higher if we still have the chromatic channel gain much higher than the luminous channel gain, we will still have double opponency, even though they it's no longer zero frequency band, so it could be the next one. So the neuron could be tuned to orientation already, but still have double opponency. Therefore, the double opponent cells are often untuned to orientation, although they can also be orientation tuned depending on their preferred frequency band, whether it's really at the zero or slightly away from zero frequency. The spatial opponency, as some excitatories, some inhibitory, depending on what the space is, means that the cell is not sensitive to zero spatial frequency. 
This comes naturally when the frequency band itself does not include zero frequency or when the gain to the zero frequency is relatively smaller than the gain to the non-zero frequency within that band. Now let's look at the other extreme here where the luminous channel having a higher gain than the chromatic channel. So the luminous gain is stronger than the chromatic gain like here. So therefore this has a bigger amplitude than this chromatic channel. And uh, we also make it smaller because this is higher frequency. So the rest of the fields are smaller in spatial extent. Again, start with a one dimensional space for illustration. Now again, to the summation and difference, this one will dominate in both. And therefore you will have the red filter and the green filter resembling this dominant contributor. And in such a case, this cell will be insensitive to the difference between red and green. So this cell will be not very sensitive to color. For instance, it could be a smallest field that's tilted tuned to a particular orientation, but not sensitive to color. Now let's look at an intermediate frequency band where the gains to the chromatic and the luminance signals are comparable with each other. Then combining these two filters together to build the red and green filters, the results will depend very sensitively on exactly what are the phases for one filter versus the phase for the other one. Here we show seven pairs of examples of these two phases. In each pair, the black curve is for the filter for the luminous signal and the colored curve is for the filter for the um, chromatic signal. They have comparable amplitude in each of these seven pairs, but they can have very different phases or similar phases as examples. And for each example pair in the same column, we show the resulting red and green filters. And uh, here we make the green filter as the summation of the two filters, two original filters, and the red filter as the difference between the two original filters in each example. Yeah, um, this is just for illustration. This is opposite to what we did in previous slides, since there are two different ways to assign whether the summation or difference is given to the red filter. You may also ask why V1 has these phase values that we do not know, but assuming that with an overcomplete representation in V1, many possible phases can be implemented. So these are just examples of possibilities to give us an idea of the diversity of color selective recitative fields. In this first example, the two filters have almost the same phase. So adding them together gives a highly sensitive green filter, but subtracting them from each other gives a very weak red filter, making this cell very sensitive to green, but not so much to red. In this cell, it's the opposite because the, these two original filters have the opposite phases. In this one, these two filters have their phases roughly perhaps 90 degrees apart. So the cell, resulting cell, is uh, almost equally sensitive to red and green, but the most sensitive location to red is slightly shifted spatially from the most sensitive location to green. In this example, we get a green bar detector, but to red, it's more like an edge detector. Yeah. And this example is a slight modification from that example. Yeah, so making the cell still very sensitive to green and moderately sensitive to red. Here is an example cell that has a um, red bar detector, but green edge detector, opposite to that example. And this cell yeah, is interestingly very sensitive to red. Uh, but mostly for inhibition suppressed by red color. 
while moder moderately sensitive to green color. In these intermediate region of the frequency band, we see that they are neurons are actually not in the center of you know zero frequency so therefore they are tuned to orientation and uh, so therefore these neurons they're not only sensitive to color they're also orientation tuned of course these neurons are also equally sensitive to luminance because these uh, are the bands where the luminance sensitivity and chromatic sensitivities are comparable